Welcome back guys. We are now on video two for chapter nine, which is monopolies. We were discussing the barriers to entry up here. And we said that barriers to entry include economies of scale and exclusive ownership of a scarce resource. And I would like to discuss with you a little bit more in detail what economies of scale are. Notice they're not called economics of scale. This is just something I notice that students make. It's called economies of scale or diseconomies of scale. Economies of scale and diseconomies, diseconomies of scale dictate the average total cost, which is right here. When there is additional production, notice how as we move down the x-axis, the numbers get bigger, right? There's more production. As this company produces more, at least from maybe 5 or 10 units all the way to this quantity here, they are reducing the average total cost, which makes them able to lower the price of their product and therefore be more competitive. Economies of scale are achieved when a company is able to reduce average total cost. Now, in a minute, I'm going to show you numerically how that works. It's rather simple, but it's really nice to see. The greater its production becomes, right? You produce more, you're lowering the ATC. It's right here on the first half of the bell curve. Their production scale is so large, it's way more economical for them to produce than it would be a newcomer. Basically, their size protects them. I do have a special video on that where I walk you through it, you know, on a board. So please take a look at that one. But let me show you an example here. So here's what we're going to do with this example. We're going to explain how we end up being on this descending part of this curve bell. This smile. I like to think of it as a smile. There we have a machine that has 5,000 units capacity. The fixed cost, which doesn't change whether you produce one unit or whether you produce 5,000, meaning if you produce one unit, your fixed cost is 1,000. If you produce 5,000 units, then your fixed cost is divided over 5,000 units, so it's going to become one-fifth that. Now, what I mean is it gets divided. You have 1,000 divided by 5,000, so you end up with $5 per. Okay. But this is not what I want to, what I want to focus on. I want to focus that it's a 5,000 units maximum. You have a fixed cost of 1,000 and you have a variable cost of $1. So 1,000 doesn't change. What happens if we produce just 1,000 units? So this is a company now that can potentially produce, let's say, 5,000 units per day, but they start at 1,000. At 1,000, the fixed cost is 1,000. The variable cost is $1 per and we're producing 1,000 units. That's why it's $1 times 1,000. And we divide that by the number of units we're producing. So it's $2,000 divided by 1,000 units. The average total cost, which is the per unit cost, is $2. Okay, great. Now this company ends up producing more. Now they're up to 3,000. What does that do? Now their total cost is going up, but their average total cost is coming down. Here's your fixed cost of 1,000. Your variable is 3,000 because it's $1 times 3,000 divided by the 3,000 units. The average total cost is now $1.33. So here's what this means. When this company is increasing its production, so imagine, for instance, we are right here at this point right here on the right here. So let's say um, is 1,000. Now take us down here to 3,000 and you see that it is going down to $1.33. This makes them able to lower the price of their product and makes them even more competitive. And when they produce 5,000 units, now their average total cost is $1.20. It's 1,000 in fixed, that doesn't go away. And then you have the one uh, times 5,000, which is the $5,000 in variable. So it's 6,000 divided by five, and that makes it $1.20. Um, and so basically what's happening here, so the fixed cost is a lot lower and the variable cost is, you know, what's taking over. So you're looking at that basically 20 cents in, um, in uh, what did I say before? It's not $5, it's 20 cents. And I think that's what I said before, but it's 20 cents here for your fixed. And so basically the average total cost is $1.20. So what we're seeing here is that as this company produces more, they're able to lower the average total cost. Now, why is this important? It's important because imagine this company is a company, like for instance, if you take a company like Walmart, why are they able to produce or bring to market the same product way cheaper than someone else? That's because of their volume. 
So we take this company that's selling uh, that has a, a dollar and 20 cents average total cost. They can charge only a dollar 50 in price and make 30 cents on a profit. But a newcomer coming onto the market, they might only be able to produce a thousand units per day because if you have a monopoly and they're producing 5,000 units per day, this is the market. They have 100% of the market share. If somebody wants to compete with them, they have to actually steal some of their sales. And there's no way they're stealing all of their sales. You know, so let's say they can maybe try to compete with 1,000 uh, of the of those sales. Well, they're in trouble because their average total cost is going to be higher. Now, their average total cost might actually be higher than $2. For instance, a newcomer might have to advertise. Uh, they might have to maybe give concessions. And that might make their operation even more complex than that. But let's say their numbers are exactly the same company that's the the monopoly can charge a dollar fifty and make a profit and this newcomer has to charge two dollars just to break even and why would people buy from somebody they've never heard of for two dollars when they can just pay 75 percent of that of a dollar and uh 50 cents and actually know the company are familiar with the company they trust the company more so you see this monopoly becomes entrenched due to economies of scale the number one reason why economy why a monopoly a market monopoly exists is because of economies of scale that would be the most likely scenario other competitors are not able to undercut them and therefore they are not able to penetrate the market and that creates that very hard barrier to entry due to economies of scale so if you look at examples here are some examples I have two for you that are market monopolies because we have two market barriers and I have three for you that are government monopolies because we have three legal barriers. So the market monopolies, Stern Pinball of Melrose uh, Park, Illinois, this is the only company that produces, they produce around 10,000 units a year and the barrier to entry is economies of scale. Now, if you think about it, how many people are still buying pinball machines? I mean, everybody is playing video games on their phones or on some console. But, you know, you have some uh, bars that maybe still want them or somebody who has like a retro basement who may still want them. So there is some market to them for, you know, for the retro arcades. But it is so small that only one company has survived. Therefore, to compete with them, somebody would have to actually out um, undercut them and there's no way because they have bought their machines a long time ago they know their market uh, they are able to produce maybe something vintage looking they have the expertise they have it's going to be very very difficult and the market is so small so to go after a very small market isn't usually the wisest thing to do our next example is the national fish and wildlife agency of forensics in ashton oregon it's actually the only one of its kind in the world and the reason nobody can compete with it Partly it's because of how specialized it is. And because it's specialized and it has to do with the legal rights uh, of wildlife and plus other things, they work with scientists around a bunch of issues. Well, now you have spe specialists. There aren't that many of them. So that's the exclusive ownership, the brains behind the operation and the economies of scale also. It's a very expensive thing. They, they have to fund you know, they have to be able to raise money, they have to be able to pitch, they have to be able to swim upstream against all kinds of people who are pushing against them, who don't really care about animals or the environment. It's pretty tough. So between it's, um, it's expensive and between you can't find the right people easily, it ends up being a, a unique monopoly due to a market barrier and both of them exist here. Now, as far as government monopolies, Crane & Company, which I mentioned before, that actually produces all the linen, linen paper has the only license in the United States to do so. So that is a monopoly due to license. That's a legal monopoly or a government monopoly. Electric and water companies, right? Those are public franchises. Your cable company in town, your natural gas, if you can't buy it from anybody else. This is whom you have to deal with. That makes it a public franchise. And any patented anything, and I am using medicine, and this is the most expensive medicine in the world. It has to do with the spine and spinal injuries and and uh, the patent for this one was over two million dollars so patents is patents can be really expensive which is partly why medication is so expensive now i'm not saying all the pricing and medication is justified i am just saying some of the price has to do with how expensive the patents are 
and how expensive obviously the research itself was be before um, and getting it approved and all that legality the fda and all that process okay so these are our examples i'm going to stop the video right here and pick up in video number three with price searchers and price and and price setters and how basically how does that all that good stuff work see you in video three